This is a real life story set in a vast land, the San Luis Valley of Colorado. It's a huge flat prairie flanked by mountains and far off the beaten path. Add to that to the mystery of seeing remote settlements while driving through and wondering who on earth would live out in the middle of such a vast space in a little tin can or a wooden lean-to. I mean, the most basic shelters and who would subject themselves to that and why? That's author Ted Conover talking about the questions he tried to answer in his new book, Cheap Land, Colorado, on this Desideratum. A desideratum is an essential thing. I'm audiobook narrator Teresa Bakken, and I think this story is full of essential things. Like wide open spaces, what to do with a rattlesnake, the peace you find in silence, and the need for connection. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm oh, great. I'm so happy to see you. Likewise. Where are you? I'm in Riverdale, which is part of the Bronx in New York. Ted Conover lives part of his life in New York City. He's perhaps best known for spending a year as a prison guard at the maximum security prison Sing Sing in New York. The book he wrote about that experience was called New Jack, and it earned a National Book Critics Circle Award and made Ted a Pulitzer Prize finalist. His work expands and deepens what we think of as journalism. He submerges himself in often uncomfortable situations and then takes readers along with him. Today, we're talking about his latest immersive experience and his book called Cheap Land, Colorado. In his observation of small details, side by side with his big picture, geologic and historic perspectives, he paints a very complete picture with his own voice as narrator in your ear. It's not hard to picture the indigenous people who carved images into rocks near the rivers or the Hispanic people who established Colorado's oldest town, San Luis, and a still working system of communal irrigation in the southeastern corner or a pioneer wagon train. Pronghorn antelopes still roam as do feral horses and the occasional mountain lion. It's also not hard to see a through line between the homesteaders of the 19th century and the people who move out there today. Okay, so that's where we're going to start our conversation with Ted, talking about the people on the prairie. Being there put me in mind of settlers who would endure all kinds of privation in hopes of finding, you know, land they could own or gold they could mine or a life for their family. That's, that's a pretty resonant theme in American history. And when you're there, you can feel it. You know, a large number of them, I think at this point are trying to get away. There's an escape. Exactly. It's a freedom from and a freedom to. Yep live the way you want to live. Exactly. But also maybe fleeing from a horrible past. Yeah, absolutely. You can, I mean, that's been a theme in the American West for a long time, right? Getting away and starting fresh and trying to leave behind a previous version of yourself or a life you lived and starting fresh. So that all happens. And then this particular part of Colorado is one of the few places in the country where you actually, yeah, can buy five acres of land for not very much money. And that's definitive in a way, you know, that's why I called my book Cheap Land Colorado, because it's cheap. You go online and Google five acres San Luis Valley, and you'll find two dozen websites with plots, you know, from $3,500 to maybe $7,000, which I don't think exists elsewhere in Colorado and not much elsewhere in the United States. Places that 
nobody really wants to live because they're hot and windy and far from things. Um, but if you go there, you can be your own landlord. Yeah. Right. You can avoid paying utilities. You can avoid law enforcement in most cases if uh, you have a reason to want that. You can grow marijuana, at least in Colorado. And so you have various kinds of freedom that a lot of people seem to seek. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really loved in the book that you included pictures. And so I was going to ask you that one of the first first pictures in the book and this is within a few pages of you explaining that title, which you just brought up, Cheap Land. The first time I saw it come up in the story, I think Matt says it, that he had Googled Cheap Land, Colorado. Yeah. And so you show a picture of Matt's place in that in that page. And I it's it's stunning. I'm I'm gonna ask you to try to explain what a place. So someone buys this cheap piece of land. When you drive out there, what do those homesteads look like? You know, there are a small number of actual houses, stick-built houses on some kind of foundation. So it's not all ramshackle temporary structures, but I'd say mostly it is. Yeah. And a lot of start as an old RV, like I think where Matt was living was either an RV or it was camper uh, from the back of a pickup that had been built onto and so it's just a shell really and or maybe it's a larger trailer but Matt's at some point had been cut in half and expanded in the middle a wood stove had been stuck in a, a pipe you know a chimney pipe installed through the roof and it's re that's really typical, these jury-rigged shelters that are barely insulated. And, you're, you know, if the windows work, you're lucky. They're, they're drafty. Very few people have wells for water. Um, it's, it's a rough way to live. And Matt actually rented his place from a couple that lived about 50 yards away. And that picture... You can't tell in the book, but the whole end of that trailer is covered with old license plates. So it's got so it's got like 50 colors in the, the book. It doesn't show all the colors. Yes, but you can tell there are license plates <laughs> all over the edge of it. It, it. it lends itself to this sort of um, it looks nomadic. Right. Right. Like it just it feels like um, it feels nomadic. It feels like it's been plopped down there. The other thing that's in that photo is you can see the majesty of the mountains. You see the peaks with snow on them and you see them rising out of this flat land. Right. Uh, and and yet this looks so rustic. So um, it doesn't look survivable, really. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't look like you could you could make it like a human being would be too frail to survive a winter in that small structure without any insulation. And I guess, you know, that gets me to what, what you did while you were there or what organization that you tapped into while you were there is this La Puenta, La Puenta Rural Outreach yeah. um, that is tasked with, with connecting with these people and find, and making sure they're not freezing to death. Right. Right. That, and then, in a word, that's their goal is to keep people alive. Yeah. And they they started, I think, with the deaths of some homeless people in Alamosa, the biggest town in the valley, um, which, you know, is sort of famously cold in the winter. And uh, there was a nun and some other concerned citizens who thought, you know, we sh this shouldn't be happening. It would not be too hard to start something that give people without a place to sleep a place indoors to sleep. So that was the beginning of La Puente. Uh, and it has grown over the years in various ways. It has a food bank and a program for kids from troubled families and all kinds of great stuff. Uh, and they had just started this rural outreach program. And the whole idea was with more people moving out off grid, you know, solar panels are getting cheaper. 
and cell phones let people feel connected to the world, even though they live out there. And people were moving out when it was warm and then having to bail when it got cold. Because if you haven't really focused on the challenges of off grid life, you could make some bad mistakes. And if you've got, if you yourself are frail or if you have a child or a, you know, a partner who's not healthy, you're not going to do well out there in many cases. And so they thought, well, let's help some of these folks before they show up at our homeless shelter. Let's see if we could help them get firewood, like through um, uh, the Public Utility Commission in Colorado has this whole fund to provide firewood or propane to people of low income. So help them apply, um, help them get food if they run out or prescriptions if they don't have gas money and they need their insulin or. Yeah, just a lifeline, just a small, thin lifeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, little things. If people hit a rough patch, you know, until their next check comes, they're, they're stuck. Well, give them a hand. So um, I'd heard about this from my sister who worked for a foundation in Denver that was thinking of giving money to La Puente. And she said, this kind of sounds up your alley. So I paid a visit and met Matt, who you mentioned. Uh, he was the rural outreach worker for La Puente, which is kind of crazy because his territory is like the size of New Jersey. And it's one guy with an old Ford Ranger pickup truck. And I said, well, Matt, do you think you could use a hand? Could I volunteer to help you? Would you like that? He said, oh, that'd be great. So then I asked La Puente how they felt and how they would feel if I wrote about it. And um, they asked me a few questions, as they should. And I explained that anybody I write about, it's not going to be a secret. I'm going to say I'm a volunteer for La Puente, but I'm a writer. I'm here because I think people would be pretty interested in how you do it. How do you get by and why did you make this choice? And so, uh, you know, it'd be like my second visit. I'd say, when I come back, could I interview you? And occasionally people say no, um, because you meet people who are kind of skeptical, shall we say, out there. I mean, there's a lot of people who don't trust journalists. They don't trust city people i mean much less a new yorker <laughs> <laughs> that was like such a burden to have to explain yeah what are you doing here what are you doing here yeah skeptical afraid really sort of things born of fear too you know totally that's totally it but you know there i am i've got this old truck i'm not there's nothing fancy uh and i always make clear that they know this is kind of my approach as a writer i have the good fortune to be educated but there's all these things i know nothing about like how to survive off grid i know so little and if you miss off grid person could help me understand i would i'll write it down and i um i'll use your lessons in my own life so i uh, that's kind of my style is I ask to be educated and most people out there are not used to being considered an authority in anything. And, and so a lot of them will talk. Yeah, it's actually such a great lesson to say to come from a place of curiosity to, but, oh, I see you've done this. And how did you do that? And not and not a place of um, but it's, it's not nosy. It's. It's curiosity, you know? <laughs> I do know. And I also know the thing I struggle with is their fear of being judged because, yeah. you know, there's like people missing their teeth or people who haven't taken a bath in a while. Yeah. And they know that they carry a stigma, right? They know that if they walk yeah. into McDonald's, people might look at them or have an opinion about them. Mm -hmm. And so I have to make clear I am not here to judge you i'm here to learn and um that's a kind of important step and it's not automatic and you find that you bring prejudices unconsciously right like the whole teeth thing it's hard not to think why haven't you fixed your teeth 
why don't you have dentures? You're only 30 years old. Or like Stacy, the mom of the family I rented from from a, for a while, she asks me, you're probably wondering about my teeth. And she says, I want you to know it's not for meth. And so that's, you know, that's an association people know you might make and they want to head it off. And um, yeah. there's so many issues like that. We, we, we carry a lot of judgments and stereotypes and um, becoming conscious of them is, is a big part of doing this kind of work. Yes, I would, I would say that reading this, it's clear to me that you come, you came to the place with a sense of uh, awe and respect for the hardship of it and curiosity. And also, I think because of the connection to La Puente, the, this idea that that we're stronger together or that we lift each other up. That's it, exactly. I think you said you worked as a journalist. And, and so you know that traditionally journalists are not supposed to get involved. Yes. Right? You're not supposed to join the group to report the story you your power comes from your independence but seems to me if you're reporting about people who are struggling there is nothing wrong with lending a hand and in fact it would feel bad not to you'd feel like you're just some kind of cold observer if you yeah if you have a way to help somebody and you're not doing it that just feels that's kind of sucks really it, it, right. I just don't want to be that person I don't want to be the no. person asking those questions so this made me comfortable because I'm doing I'm trying to help and then I think you know people appreciate it so that was kind of my approach yes one of the things I love that happens to you through this story because you are also kind of a character in this book. Right. This is right. an immersive experience. You uh, you share with the reader what your experience, not just the people that you are meeting along the way. And you start off and you're renting, you're just a, a few yards from the family that you're renting from, and you're sort of immersed in their family life and what's going on with them. But you come to a point where you kind of double down. And you're like, you know, I think I'm actually going to go all in on this. <laughs> And buy my own piece of cheap land, Colorado. Yeah, so it just seemed like a natural progression. Like, here I am, I'm a renter, and I wasn't actually the only uh, renter on that property. As you know, I'm just a few yards away from a couple that has arguments and... Um, they like to drink and I'm thinking I'm back in the Bronx or something. <laughs> I'm, I'm in, in a place where people come because they can own their own land. So maybe I should just do that and uh, enjoy the quiet. And so it wasn't for a couple of years though, that I, I did that because, because all lots are not the same, right? Right. I was looking for something in specific. So I was looking for a lot that would be near somebody I knew and trusted so that if I have a little trailer there, there, the odds improve that it won't be gone when I return because that happens out there. Things that are not tied down and even things that are tied down disappear. Yeah. There was a story about like the, the actual like axles get removed from one like the thing is turned upside down and the axles are removed while the person's gone and so yeah you definitely your safety is dependent on others yeah and that was and it that was also a surprise to me i guess i didn't expect that this remote lifestyle the people that chose that would then be sort of connective tissue with each other yeah you're right. You think, oh, they don't talk to each other, but that's the furthest thing from the truth. They're like in each other's business, even if they can't see the place over the hill, right? Yeah. There aren't that many roads in and there aren't that many people. And you tend to, you tend to somehow be aware of what's going on. And people use Facebook Messenger, you know, even if they only have one bar signal, Messenger lets you, um, text or or call if if the signal's better and and 
and you'll find people, yeah, who you know go and are going into Walmart early in the month. You do you want to share a ride? Uh, you know, could you buy me some dog food? Um, there are benefits to having neighbors. So anyway, I waited till I found a piece of land that seemed right and then um went for it. And I still own it. My great fear is just like you mentioned, Teresa, I'd return from being away and I'd find my this ancient trailer that came with the property. I'd find it on its side with its axles removed because that told me they're solid steel. They're worth 500 bucks each. And uh, I'm thinking, oh, it would just break my heart if that happened because I've put, I've put a lot of work into like excavating this trailer and getting the mice out and um, yeah. uh, making it livable. And I still go, I suppose another author would be on to the next thing, but I, I don't, I'm not ready to leave. I, I'm, I, it's part of my life at this point. Yes. There was a part in the book and I think I even wrote it down because I thought, Oh wow. He's really not just doubling down on this immersive reporting experience, but you, you find a sense of, um, of yourself there and that, that it was different from other immersive reporting. So the people who, who have followed your stories in the past know that you've done this kind of years long, large scope, big picture understanding of things. And you can do that in this book. We get deep down history of this region and the layers going back of why things are the way they are and um, and why the land is, is divided and cheap the way that it is. But you also come to this place where you're like, yeah, I'm not, I want this experience to last. And what I thought was so funny in that section was you start talking about how time is measured and you're in Colorado on your land there and you bruise your thumbnail and the time that it takes it to grow out <laughs> is how I was like, oh my God, the time is measured in, in fingernail growth. <laughs> but there's a pace of that, right? That's very different from the other parts of your life. There is. But yeah, that I'm embarrassed to say I, uh, in trying to repair my fence, I have mangled my fingers uh, with a hammer more than once, but it's like a souvenir I take back to my city life. Uh, and I get to, yeah, measure how long it's been since that happened by watching my fingernails. But to, to your point, you know, I'm best known for a book where I became a New York state corrections officer. And I worked in a prison in Sing Sing prison for almost a year. And I could not wait to get out of there because that is such a stressful environment and um corrections officers are under so much especially the young the new ones like me and it just under a lot of pressure from both from prisoners who kind of want to intimidate you and from older corrections officers who want to intimidate you mm -hmm. so you, it's really stressful and i just i was so happy to leave there every single day and I'm so sad to return the next day. And in the San Luis Valley, it has not been like that. Mm. You know, I can have enough of solitude and I can have enough wind or terrible weather that I'll be happy to get back to another place, especially sometimes a place with humidity because it's so dry there that, uh, you know, my, my sinuses dry out and I start sneezing and, um, I miss the muggy New York summer, but apart from that, I really like the, being there. I like who I am there. I'm more relaxed. I'm less anxious. And um, so, yeah, it's a little bit of a memoir along with a cultural exploration. Yeah. I, there are lots of stories in this, um, lots of characters, lots of real people. Um, one of the most uh, harrowing stories that I was just going to ask you to, to retell a little is that you have to relocate at one point a rattlesnake. And, and one of the things that I thought was fascinating about this is what you just mentioned a minute ago, and that was about Facebook. So you use YouTube uh, in your problem solving with this rattlesnake problem. Oh, yeah. And I that part of it was 
intriguing to me. I don't know why I didn't expect to find social media in yeah. the San Luis Valley. Yeah. But yeah, I guess first, first tell me the story of the rattlesnake and how you solved the problem. And then I want to know your thoughts about social media. Sure. So my property has a couple of old sheds on it. And uh, as I was walking by a shed one summer day, I heard a sound that just made me stop in my tracks. And um, I think it must, I think in our, our ancient brain, right? We know what that means when we hear a rattle rattling. Yeah. I was just like, what? could that be? And I've been expecting to see one for a long time. This wasn't until the third year I was there that I can't, I'd seen countless ones dead on roads or, you know, their heads caught off by my neighbors. Everybody kills them instantly because they worry about their dogs. They worry about themselves. They're very anti-rattler. Um, I, being a different kind of prairie person, did not want to cut off its head but nor did i want it to be right there where i put my old paint cans yeah so i did go to youtube because if you can get a good enough signal out there youtube can help you fix a barbed wire fence or as you know just about anything and there's so many different people on youtube who will tell you how they catch a rattlesnake and you kind of have to figure out what's your style are you going to be the macho texas snake handler who has big boots and a special clamp and um you know but at the last minute grabs it with his hand or are you gonna what <laughs> i i i settled on this wisconsin school teacher who uh found a snake in his wood pile and heated up a piece of pvc tubing in his fireplace into a crook that he could lift the snake with and he puts it in a 10 gallon drywall putty container with a lid and then he puts it on the passenger seat of his car and drives it to a park. I took it to BLM land, uh, which there's a lot of down there. Um, and it's across the Rio Grande river from me. Uh, so I thought that's pretty safe, but, oh, I, I, if I'm mocked by my neighbors for anything, it's the fact that I, do not kill my snakes. And they just say, well, you, they may think you're smart in New York, but we know dumb when we see it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think what I loved about the story was that you know, it's there. You talk about that region of our brain that knows this is bad. This is bad. Yeah. And how then though you are, you have an appreciation for it. Right. Like you notice it's sunning, like you go back, keep your distance, but you actually do sort of a, a curiosity reconnaissance kind of observational journalism with it. Right. You're right. I wanted I wanted to take my time and understand it. Like, when does it come out? Yeah. When does it want to be in the sun? When does it go away? And it would clearly go away into a hole under my shed. You could see. And the first time it saw me it rattled its rattle for i don't know a couple minutes and then it slithered back under the shed so it doesn't want to fight right it's not looking to tangle with it's not aggressive no no it's not and so hey live and let live right i don't have a dachshund who's going to get bit by this thing and i don't have a child if I did, I'd, I'd feel differently. Right. I'm just, I'm just a guy who should be able to look where he's going, and and we should be able to live and let live. I think so. I think so. I thought it was a great example of that, and I thought the idea that you went on YouTube, and that there were multiple options, like you said, there were many different ways to deal with a rattlesnake, <laughs> and you found one that suited you best, and it had to do with creating sort of a shepherd's hook out of PVC and relocating said dangerous beast and that felt right that felt like the right thing to do but at the same time I was also just thinking oh I just don't know if I could have how terrified I would have been to 
in the process of it. Like I, I, this is a tangent, but my son and I decided to do honey bee keeping and uh, we watched YouTube videos and we went to a club and we learned everything we had to learn. And then we, we got the nucleus of a colony in our, the back of our pickup and brought it to our property and we had to set it up. And in the physical doing of the, like, you know, you open the lid and the hum of these bees that are, they know they're in the wrong place. They don't know what's going on. They're worried. This, this, this volume of panic from thousands of stinging insects had like a physical effect on me. I was like, I actually, <clears throat> I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> but it's so um, riveting to approach something dangerous like that. And some part of you is reassured that this is rational. People do raise bees. Right. People do catch snakes you're not crazy and yet your heart's going and i have an editor my book editor for new jack the prison book said i've noticed that you keep being attracted to these dangerous subjects mm. and i said yeah and he said so i think the thing about you is you're counterphobic you you are you want to overcome your fear and you and you put yourself in situate he's my editor being an, uh, a new yorker through and through you know he's totally into psychoanalysis and all this but <laughs> but he um looking for the deeper meaning but i'd never even heard of the word counterphobic but yeah it means like interested in overcoming a fear and i i get that and um it's true and it's also it's like anything that goes wrong when you're writing nonfiction, it's fun to write about, right? Like any challenge, any stroke of bad luck, the silver lining is this will be fun to write about. Well, and some of this, I felt like life is stranger than fiction. I think at one point you, Matt, maybe it's Matt or maybe it's Lance that says, you can't make this stuff up. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know. And, and I guess, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to hold up any one character as a like, what a train wreck. I think I'd rather, I really love when your story intersects with Zara's. And one of the things that I loved about that intersection was you get to a place where uh, we know how immense this valley is. And yet the through the people, it actually feels small. And one of your connections to Zara is that Paul another person in the valley has also given her a plate of candy. And so as you're really, as you're getting to know her, you realize you share this connection with another person. Right. And that. It's so cool. It's so cool. Sarah is a single mom with four or five kids from Chicago. She worked as a housekeeper in a hotel. She had an abusive husband. She bails. She rents a car from enterprise and, shows up on the prairie at a half-built house with this guy. He's part of a movement to build a new community of Africans in the diaspora. And she's all into black power. And but he's not a good guy either. Yeah. And and so her neighbors who are mostly white people end up being really helpful to her as she extracts herself and finds a place to hide from him. And Paul who, as you recall, um, introduced himself to me by saying, yes, my name's Paul and I'm gay. <laughs> I just said, wow, <laughs> okay, let's get it out there. Um, he says, you've got to meet her. He helped me set up an interview. And then, yeah, when she describes how Paul shows up at her, at her shack with this paper plate and Christmas cookies underneath a wrapper with that curly ribbon tying it. I'm like, oh my God, that's what he brought me. And yeah. so, yeah, you feel this kinship with people from another universe, basically, because you're just spending time in the same space being human together. And um, so I love that stuff. I love seeing unexpected things in common and, um, and just seeing people who are admirable where you least expect it, right? Like somebody determined to make herself a better life and um, willing to really go through so much on, on the way to that 
So not only, yeah, does she go into the this area of white people with all these very pro-African views, very strong political views, but then she moves into Alamosa months later. She's the Colorado representative of the new Black Panther Party. She's got this tattoo of the African continent with yellow, red, and green stripes on it, uh, visible under her collarbone. And what does she do? She falls in love with a cowboy from Monta Vista who, yeah. who's smitten by her and it, you know, wants to help her tie her roller skate when she's at a roller derby practice in Salida. Yeah. And now they're married. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you can't make it up. And it's it's kind of a fantastic that um that I live in the same world as them. Yeah. I enjoyed her. I thought she could be her own book, actually. Totally, she could. She could probably write it herself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that Paul is one of the people who threads through your time there and is kind of one of those connective tissue people. And he, like everyone else, really doesn't fit a mold. And I think that's that's something you sort of alluded to at the beginning about not judging things, right? Like, don't make a judgment that everyone here is X, Y, and Z, right? Because there's Paul, and as soon as he meets you, he says, I'm Paul and I'm gay. <laughs> and his own way of saying, like, I'm different than what you're expecting. I'm not who you think I am, yeah, right? Yeah, I think that's, that's right. And then for me, Paul becomes someone that helps you find meaning in this whole experience through being able to see Paul's humanity, but also to see his frailties. Um, and it also really points out the value of what La Puente does, which is, you know, yeah, lifelines to people. Yeah, Paul, Paul, he's quite open about being needy in certain ways and having fragile uh, emotional equilibrium. And, uh, and he reaches out for help, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he's doing well right now, but it's cyclical and everybody knows this, all his neighbors and, and even the conservative Mormons uh, uh, up the hill who are his nearest neighbors look out for him. Yeah. You know, they probably don't appreciate a lot of his uh, lifestyle or way of looking at the world, but it's sort of unexpectedly diverse. And because of that, people who are unlike each other are kind of put in situations where they might have to deal with somebody quite unlike them, more than I do in New York, actually. Yes. Uh, so that's a surprise, too. Yes. I was thinking that. I was thinking that in, in major metropolitan areas, there's an, an, an anonymity mm -hmm. that allows us to then insulate ourselves in our own bubbles, for lack of a better word, right? Yep. But not there. Yep. All your all your Venn diagrams are overlapping. All of your <laughs> all of your bubbles are bumping into each other. That's right. And it it is for me that was one of the big picture themes of the book, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Was that what's happening right here is a lesson about the divisiveness. Is an example of what the divisiveness you certainly run into divisiveness, but it's also a lesson in maybe how we overcome that from this from this fringe. Yeah, I agree. And that is that was completely unexpected to me. I thought this is the fringe. It's going to be full of angry people who are sick and tired and don't want to deal with that kind of person or that kind of person. And instead, it's a different, it's its own world where not everybody wants to connect, but a significant number do. And and they are each other's social world. And there's, you know, there's rifts, there's feuds, but there's people who have little, you know, my house caught fire. We'll stay on my couch for the next week. That happens all the time. Or um, I hit a deer, I hit an elk. Uh, I'll drive you into town to, um, you know, or I'll take your kids to school or, you know, People with kids, especially, I think, try to find ways to coordinate and look out for each other. And uh, so, yeah, uh, that was a surprise. 
And my very first hint of it, back to the beginning of the book, is when I would be driving around, like making cold calls at these properties where I didn't even know if anyone was home. And, you know, out of five places, I meet somebody who will talk to me. And then the next day I meet somebody else and start to explain who I am. And they say, oh, well, I, don't, I know all about you. I know you, you tried to knock on the door of that place. It's been empty for three years. Like they'll tell you, you know, everybody in a place like that pays attention to the vehicles that drive by. And, um, and mine was kind of distinctive. And so, yeah, immediately you're, you're known that way. And then the next day you're known because they're going to Google you. Yes. I did want to come back to that, that um, social media the prevalence of it there in some ways you you spotlight how this is a negative right that the the misinformation and the mistrust and the fears that can be stoked by a source like facebook because it's used as a source of information and then also as a place of grievances i think there was a part of the book where you're there during during parts of covid and i think People have trusted you. You've been going there often enough now that you you sometimes will have an answer to something that they're like, well, I, I don't know about that. I'm really skeptical. I don't, I don't know what to believe. And yet you're a trusted source, right? But the other source they've had is Facebook. Yeah. So you got to tread carefully there. Um, you know, because there's a lot of offhand remarks that might strike you as unkind or hateful about every, you know, from Anthony Fauci to Hillary Clinton to Barack Obama, there's lots of people who are sort of held up as straw men, right? Like bad. Yeah. Or, you know, go brand and all this, like all that stuff is very much on Facebook. And a lot of my neighbors share it, but I've got to say a lot of them don't. And the real engagement on social media out there, it's mostly Facebook. And mostly it's, you know, people posting about something that happened. And sometimes they'll just say, oh, God, not again. And that's the whole post. And then somebody comments, oh, what happened? And there'll be a whole thread about the brake line leaked and my truck broke again. And so uh, it's both a way to bind people and let them share their experiences. And then, yeah, there's that connection to the the anger of our political situation right now, which um, makes me not want to go on social media. That's so interesting that it, it works like a local radio or a local local newspaper or a classifieds or a bulletin board in a grocery store. Totally. If you were going to tap it back to some other form of communication, but instead of having to go into town and get the latest from the grocery store, you're that that form of social media works like a uh, an information system. Totally does. Is a positive. It helps people keep people connected. Yeah. But then when it's utilized as a what's going on in the world and you already have sort of this level of mistrust of government and police and I mean, not not even a level, but like a massive amount of mistrust. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's fascinating that you could see the positives of it. Oh, yeah. And one of the things people love to share is like the sheriff's office Facebook page will tell about a fugitive, right? Or a missing kid mm. or, uh, you know, some shootout somewhere, be on the lookout. And these that gets shared a lot. It's spread like wildfire, yeah. Yeah. And maybe it's less like the telephone game. Yeah. It, you know, it, you could go back on the thread and read everything. You know exactly what Bob said because it's right there. Exactly. It's less maybe of a You're right. corruption of information because it's, you can go back and read it. Yeah. You're right. Well, if you compare it to telephone, that game where you pass on a message and see how distorted it gets by the fifth or sixth person, it's but it's better than that. And and yeah, it is amazing how smartphones and social media have made even these remote prairie dwellers, you know, I'll get messages. Have you seen that that duck in Central Park? Oh, because they're connected to you and they're watching what happens in New York because they're connected to you in New York. Yeah, they just think, oh, this happened in New York. You, you must know about it because you're in New York. You must know about that duck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or here's a mural somebody painted in the Bronx. Is that close to you? Wow. Or the whole 
you know, during COVID, like numbers of people dying, people would ask me, is that true? Is it true that hospitals have these refrigerated trailers outside because there's so many dead bodies? And actually, my neighbor works at one of them, and he was telling me exactly that. So I said, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, it's killing a lot of people. I don't know if it'll always kill a lot of people, but yeah. a lot of people are dying. I can tell you that. So I just... I'm cautious. I'm so cautious with politics because it just seems you throw a match on a pile and yeah. and um, an argument begins. But I do think my experience out there shows how much I have in common with them, how much we all have in common if we can get past the noise. Right. Yes, that's a great point. Um, one of the things that I, you've been really generous, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to wrap it up. Towards the end of the book, your your neighbor Robert has an auger, and you're putting in a fence, and you end up bartering. Yeah, it was a mind shift. It was a way, a different way of seeing things that we, that was already in place when you got there. And it just felt to me like at that point in the in your time there, you it just was an automatic almost for you to consider a barter. Yep, and one of the things I really love about that is it's just so human, right? It's not about data or numbers or something with a decimal point. It's like, uh, here, I don't need this. You need that, but I could use that. Yeah. And, and then, and so it's a, it's a transaction that's more personal and that you're going to remember. Right. And, and maybe you'll repeat some version of it. And it's like earlier you were describing how, how unique Matt's dwelling was. And in a way that's, it's also, this is not cookie cutter housing in a suburb. This is like incredibly individualistic solutions to how do I stay warm in the, in a harsh environment. And, and it's, you think, Oh my God, that's, that's scary. It's so poorly made, but on the other hand, it's so real and it's so, human and you see somebody who's put together this house out of 200 different sources of thrown out material and you have to give it some respect yeah well the the last question i always ask um has to do with the name of the podcast so i named it desideratum it's based off of a poem desiderata because it was full of good life lessons and desideratum itself means essential thing so for you and you could answer as you as you traveled through this particular immersive story or just in general for you. If someone says, what's essential? What is essential to you, Ted? How would you answer? Hmm. Well, here are some essential things from my book. Land is an essential thing. Um, listening is an essential thing. To write this book, I listened so much. Mm. And then uh, the, the space, the place is so big and something in it communicates opportunity and potential and hope. Mm. Um, and I know Desiderata is about sort of, uh, it's like go placidly. Um, right yes yes go placidly amid the noise and haste and remember what peace there may be in silence right well that's the peace there may be in silence is a part of it too uh because peace is what uh people seek and i think often find out there and silence is another part of it yeah that that's not too hard to draw some connections to yeah love that thank you thank you you totally get my book and I um I find it very gratifying to talk about it with you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed getting to know Ted Conover as much as I did. I want to thank the Colorado Sun for shining their light on Ted's work. I listen to the Sun's podcast called The Daily Sun Up. And every Sunday, I check out the Sun Lit feature at coloradosun.com for author spotlights. Sunlit editor Kevin Simpson often talks to authors on the Daily Sunup's Friday podcast. Check it out 
at coloradosun.com or wherever you're listening to this podcast. Ted will be in Denver for the Colorado Sun's Sunfest Ideas Conference. I'll put a link for tickets in the show notes. And I'll link the La Puente organization Ted volunteers with so you can find out more about the good work they do. One more big thank you to the audio publisher, Random House Audio, for the excerpt from Cheap Land, Colorado. And as always, thank you for listening.